Edwin Frondozo on the Business Leadership Podcast every week for a unique program featuring insights and actionable items from the world's most successful business leaders. Hear firsthand the exclusive interviews and personal journeys on how today's transformational leaders made it to the top. Hey everybody, it's me, it's Edwin, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Business Leadership Podcast. On this episode, you will hear the conversation that I had with Mark Organ, the founder and CEO of Influtive. I was eager to speak with Mark given his track record of growing and scaling cloud-based companies. He likes to coin himself a professional entrepreneur where he looks at entrepreneurship as a career. I really enjoyed hearing his philosophy and the application of the scientific method, whether it's deciding on a product to launch or choosing a market segment or how to create a culture for growth. But before jumping in, just a quick shout out to my friends at IT World for their support of the podcast. Enjoy the show. Mark, welcome to the show. Ah, oh, delighted to be here. Awesome, awesome. Like I said, before we even pressed record, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I, I mean, personally, I'm really eager to hear your stories, your experiences, leading businesses, leading technology business. But I guess before we get started, Mark, if you could share with the listeners out there a little bit about yourself. Tell us who you are, what you like to do, and, and perhaps what you love to do when you're not leading companies or building companies. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've been an entrepreneur almost as long as I can remember. My parents told me that when I was uh, like seven years old, I was selling uh, pills from our medicine cabinet. I'm not sure who would buy that or why, but I've always been really interested in working for myself. I've been a very independent person. Uh, I was quite, quite a defiant child, uh, and I'm now being uh, punished for that by having a defiant son now myself. Um, but I got in trouble a lot in school, and uh, I got I got fired from from a few jobs that I've had. So I, I've had always had kind of a challenging time with authority, and maybe that's why I've really dedicated myself now to being the best entrepreneur that I can be. If I'm fated to do this, um, to start companies and to grow them and and lead them, then I should do the best job that I possibly can at it. Uh, so that's kind of the way I characterize myself now as I think of myself as a professional entrepreneur and just try to get better and better with every company that, that I start. Um, in terms of what I like to do when I'm not leading companies, honestly, I love business. I love all aspects of it. Um, even when I'm not doing things in business, I'm still reading about it. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a member of other boards of directors so that I can be involved with other businesses I do have a family. I try to spend as much time as I can, um, you know, with them. And I'm getting into physical fitness. I love networking, so I like meeting other people. It's a big passion of mine. Uh, but honestly, I I love entrepreneuring, and it's my favorite thing to do. Oh, that's awesome! That's awesome. I, and you know what, Mark? I could even feel the energy just uh, just talking to you about about your passion about it, about, about business, and I'm sure. I mean, if there is no time limit, we could probably geek out all day in terms of talking about business or even a small aspect of, of running a business. So with having said that, why don't we first start off where you, what you're doing right now. Tell us about your current business, your current company, Influitive. I mean, your current mission out there, what, what you're trying to do. Yeah, so at Influitive, we are helping companies grow more efficiently by mobilizing their happy customers to do more for them. Uh, so and this is something that, I mean, really my whole business career, I've noticed that, you know, the best way to acquire customers is, is not to acquire them through your sales and marketing, but is to get your customers to acquire more customers for you. Whether I was running my, uh, my, my house painting company and I was making customers happy and they were referring other businesses or writing testimonials, you know, all the way to my last company, Eloqua, where, you know, we found that this sort of advocate activity was super important to winning customers efficiently. You know, the challenge is, is that it's not easy to do. It's not easy to systematically get your customers to refer more business, to tell their stories uh, on video or through text, to write five-star reviews. Uh, to serve as references, you know, that's, it's challenging to do. And what we figured out 
what I figured out actually in my last company was that um, by providing a great experience for these customer advocates, by making it more fun and rewarding and efficient for them, then they will do a lot more of that activity that uh, we value so much as, as entrepreneurs. Um, so our mission here, uh, at least on, in terms of our commercial business, and we distinguish that between our mission for our team, we'll talk about that in a second, but you know, our mission is to uh, really help companies grow effectively by mobilizing their customer advocates, and we do that by providing the best advocate experience. Um, we also have a mission for our, our team. I mean, one of the reasons why I start companies is because I love learning. I'm a total learning junkie. And, um, you know, I find the best way to learn about things that I'm really passionate about is to start a company around it. Um, and a lot of the people who come and join us are similarly really interested in maximizing their career growth and velocity. Um, so we do have a mission that uh, we want to be the vehicle by which everybody here at Influitive achieves their full potential in life, uh, both personally and professionally. We're, we're, we're a little unique in that we have this dual mission, but I, I really do believe that through uh, getting the most of our employees, that is really how we will achieve our mission for customers as well. Oh, no, no that's awesome. And you're really focused, and in, in what I'm hearing is it's purely focused on the people around you, around the company, and, and most importantly, your customers as well. And and I'm really happy to hear the type of product or the type of service you're putting together because any business owner, any entrepreneur out there or consultant, everyone knows word of mouth, referrals, 100% are probably still the best way to build that. So it, it's amazing. And thank you for putting that type of product together for businesses out there to help them you know, really utilize that channel out there properly. Yeah, thanks. No, it's, uh, it's a really exciting time to be in this space. I mean, to be in the marketing software space in general, it's a very exciting time. Uh, there's um, a huge shift of budgets from you know, the CIO to the CMO. So uh, there's, the CMO has increasingly a lot of power to make things work. And, and also at the same time, we're seeing that you know, traditional approaches to winning customers and retaining customers like email and ads and you know this is they're just not working like they used to work. I mean, think about the last time you bought something risky or expensive because of an email you received from a vendor. It's probably been a while. Whereas when you hear from a friend or when you see a friend's endorsement, it, it means a lot. Um, you know, the challenge is just it's really hard to do that systematically. So it's very exciting to be trying to crack that code on how to systematically generate this sort of advocacy and. I still think we're very early in our journey here. You know, we're six and a half years in, and I think this is like a 20, 30 year trend. And then it's just, it's fun to be working on this problem. That's great. No, that's awesome. And, and I'm, I'm really excited to follow it along as well. So, so keep it going. And I'm, sh I'm sure you'll be able to build that and build the team and the, and the customers around you. I mean, you quickly mentioned Eloqua as another business you started and, and starting a business for those out there who, who are not entrepreneurs, it's, it's hard. And let alone bootstrapping it, do, doing it with your own money. So, Mark, I really found it interesting to know, with it, I think when you started Eloqua, that your team, the people around you, went without getting paid for nine months. And really amazingly, nobody quits. <laughs> and further to the point, you didn't even draw salary for two years. You sold everything you had. You almost got bankrupt, not only once, but multiple times. So really, I, this is really for me, personal question. I would love to know how you're able to, to lead the team through that and get them to believe in your goals and your missions to work with no pay. Yeah, I think part of that was where I was in my life um, as, uh, along with the other people on the team. So I was one of the oldest people in the company at 25. <laughs> so it gives you a sense. Um, of, of where we were, right? So we were a bunch of 20-somethings uh, uh, in the middle of a pretty big recession. So this was 2001, 2002, which in the technology industry, that was a really tough time. That was after the NASDAQ tech wreck. Um, there was a lot of unemployment in the technology industry. Um, so, uh, you know, a bit of a different time than today where it really feels like much more of a go-go time and there's lots and lots of exciting startup activity. 
um, here in Toronto and around the world. Um, so I think part of it was, hey, we may not be making any money here, but we're learning a lot uh, and we're really advancing our own careers. So even if this business goes belly up, we're all the better for it. We will have learned so much more that will make us effective if we ever decide to work for people again or if we want to go and start, start a company. So I think part of it was the, a bigger vision that we all had for ourselves. Uh, myself as a founder and CEO and, and the other you know, young 20-somethings that were all senior executives in this company. So I think that's part of it. And the second thing is we really believed in the mission. Our mission was backed by, by data. Um, and I think that's so important. You know, and I'll, I'll mention this for all the budding entrepreneurs out there in terms of how you start a business that that will you know that will give you this kind of staying power. Um, but we knew that if we had if we could design a repeatable process for generating demand, and the way to do that was on the internet, um, we knew that that was a big business. Um, we knew that we were changing lives, and I know because before I started the company, I had done a lot of primary research. And I had talked to uh, so many sales professionals that were starving for lack of good quality leads. And we learned that the most important um, determinant of success of a sales rep in the companies that I, stu that I studied before I founded Eloqua together with my co-founders was the availability of good quality leads. That was more important than the education that the sales rep had, the training that they had, where they came from. Um, so, you know, and I had done all this work. I had interviewed these people, uh, both successful reps and unsuccessful ones. Um, and so through doing this primary research, it really kept me going through the dark times. And also these are the kinds of things I would communicate out to my team. I right? would tell the team, look, if, if we can last another month, another quarter, another year, one day, this is going to be a massive market. And let's, let's try to be around for when that uh, realization happens for, for, for the market. And, and it did. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we did well at Eloqua, frankly, is that we were the only ones left standing after, this, after the tech wreck. And there's a saying that in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Um, and that was absolutely true in our case, where we were the, we were the one-eyed man and, and um, all of our alternatives and competitors, they all, they all died um, in, the, in the recession. So I think that's the, the, other, the other lesson is, um, you know, if you keep your cost structure low and find a way to survive another year, you know, you could be the person that, that's made king. So I think the advice that I would, I would give people, entrepreneurs, is I think the most important job of an entrepreneur is to be the expert in a market segment. Um, and to be such an expert that you're able to be contrarian and right, right? That you're able to go against the herd, against the grain, um, where everyone else thinks that the problem you're solving is not important or it's impossible. But you know because of the research that you've done, the direct research, but actually talking to people and understanding them in a very deep level, uh, that you know that you have a big opportunity there that no one else really understands. It's something Peter Thiel calls knowing a secret. Okay? You know a valuable secret about the world that nobody else knows. Uh, that is where great, I believe, truly great businesses come from. And that's where the staying power comes from. That's when, when it looks like all is bleak and you've just, you know, you've lost your best customer, which happened to us, and, and you've lost your best, you know, you've lost your best uh, engineer, and the board all turns on you, and you're two months late from paying your rent. I mean, all of these happen to us at, at Eloqua. You keep going because you know that you're solving a very valuable problem. Uh, and you know that you are developing yourself as fast as you possibly can, faster than you'd ever be able to develop yourself if you worked for somebody else. I mean, you, you were, I think you were starting to get into it, and you might be reading up for it on it, but there was a time, and... and your advice to the entrepreneurs was to be an expert within a market segment. And I know and I read when I was doing some of my research and, and looking through that it was actually a hard decision for you and your team to, to really go 
deep and go into a micro verticalization as you as you termed it so what were the challenges at that time knowing what you know now that you faced when you had to convince and steer your team and your stakeholders to okay let, let's keep doing this but we're go actually going to make our market a little smaller yeah it was a tough time that was th there were two big decisions that we had to make and and really i had to make them and they were unpopular decisions um, it's pretty rare with me. I mean, 99% of the time, I really defer to my team, to my management team. You know, there are a couple of rare times where I, I kind of had to go my own way and really try to bring my team along. And this was one of them, which was the, um, the focus on a much, much smaller market segment. And I really, I got to credit uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Bill Tatham, who's uh, the founding CEO of JANA, who really encouraged me to do this, uh, encouraged me to focus on a much tighter segment and, and charge a lot more money because of the, the deeper knowledge that we had there. Um, that felt very uncomfortable to a number of people on our team. So people who were on the sales side said, well, there are all these people out there who might give us money, but we're not going to go and take their money because we're going to focus much more. And the same thing is true on the engineering side. That people were uncomfortable because they're like, what if we get it wrong? Like, what if this is the wrong segment? And so the way that we got, I got them along was to, as opposed to saying, this is the best way to go and, you know, and why, it's more, this is a hypothesis, right? Let's, we're, we're testing this idea that this segment over here, where we've already had some massive success, you know, even though it's a much smaller market, is going to be a better, um, a better segment for us and, and where we can make enough money where we can get profitable, which is really was our goal at the time because we didn't want to die. The best way not to die is to be profitable. And so, so this is our hypothesis. And here's what we would expect to see if the hypothesis is right. We would expect to see that we're winning new customers at a pretty good clip. We'd expect to see that our new customer launches are all go well. We expect to see that we're retaining, you know, 90% plus of that business that we're signing on. And if we get any sense that that is not true, that, you know, well, then we'll, we'll change tack, right? And that, that did bring the team along because they could see that this wasn't a decision that we're fated to make forever. It's just a hypothesis that we're testing for a good reason, right? There's a lot of good, re there's good reasons why that's a good, a good assumptions to make. And so what I should say is that before I became an entrepreneur, uh, I was a research scientist, and to some degree, I'm still doing that old job that I did 22 years ago at the lab bench, where I'm still every day thinking up new hypotheses and testing them, uh, creating mental models of how I think the future is going to look, um, and then seeing if the data supports this, the visions that, you know, the, or the model that, that we have. Um, and, and the more that I learn about entrepreneuring, the more I, I, I really see that this is the scientific method really is a great way to go about building a company because that way you, you still have a big vision, right? The vision is what I'm just calling this model, this mental model of how the world works. This is how I think why people buy our product. This is why I think users are engaged with the products because of these reasons. And you have that model and it's a powerful vision that you can communicate to people. But because it's only a hypothesis, it's changeable. You know, have you ever heard that expression to have you know, strong opinions loosely held? For a while, I, you know, Mark Andreessen says it a lot. He looks for people that have strong opinions and loosely held. And I didn't really quite understand that for a while. But now I really get it. And I think it's what it is. It's that you have a strong vision. You communicate this powerful vision. It gets people excited. But at the same time, you're willing to, as data comes in, you're willing to modify that. You're willing to change it. And I think that makes people feel comfortable that you're not going to get locked into a vision of the future that's wrong. No, oh, I mean I I love that and and it really comes down to as you as you're leading the team and the organization uh, not so much how you're doing it's really becomes the language and, and and coming from that scientific method that scientific background because using using the word hypothesis I think it's, it's you have a conviction that it may may or may not work but Hey, I'm only saying it's a hypothesis, and let's let's try it out, and and that's really important for 
entrepreneurs and even even executives within companies where they you know they want to steer or change their career around within the company and do stuff they have to have a conviction but i think using the word hypothesis was a very big thing to to get to everyone to listen to you yeah i think it's a powerful word um the other word i use a lot which is similar hypothesis is the word propose you know as opposed to I think we should do this, or let's do this, or whatever. It's like, I'd like to make a proposal. I'd like to propose X. What do you think? Right? Let's talk about that. And it's a way to really bring the team around. So as a leader, to use to, to really make proposals as opposed to issuing direct orders. Because at the end of the day, people have got to really buy in. And on the other hand, for employees, I, I recommend that they use the word, I intend to. So as opposed to, hey, Mark, what do you think about X? You know, that, that is, uh, that's not empowering for them. That's not empowering for them to ask me what I think. It, the better way is for them to say, hey, Mark, I intend to do X, and here's why. Um, and for me to say, okay. So I, I really try to, um, and I really, this is, I've learned this the hard way after many years of leading poorly, um, but it is to bring them along by using words like hypothesis and proposal and to encourage them to be more assertive and to say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Um, this is what I intend to do, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, so I don't like when they use that proposal language. I want them to be more assertive. Right, right. And, and it, it empowers them as well when they start using the language, I'm sure of it. Yeah, no, that la- language is important, right? This is, man, this is such a team sport. And, you know, more and more, this is what I'm learning, right, is my, my job is to create an environment where these people can do their best work and and are you know truly empowered to do what it is that they need to do, and uh, it also runs a better business because you end up getting decisions that are made much closer to the edge of the company, and that's a big thing I'm obsessed with right now. Uh, with you know my current company, um, you know, Influtive is about 120 people or so, um, so we're just below that famous Dunbar's number at 150, uh, where you know often organizations often break down at that size. You need very special structures in order for them to scale. So I'm, these days, I'm uh, really excited about building processes where people who are closest to the customer are making great decisions without having to ask anybody, without having to ask their boss, or God forbid ever ask me. <laughs> um, they should be able to make great decisions on their own. And I, I think that's the key to a company that's able to scale well because they can move so much faster. You're so much more agile when people can make decisions on their own. And also, they like it more. People like to drive. They don't want to be a passenger. They want to drive the bus. So this is a, it's, it's a great way to drive more employee satisfaction as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. And I love how um, you know, getting to that Dunbar's number, it's driving you to really understand and how you want to grow and I guess uh, maintain the the culture that you have today as as the organization grows. So I mean, good luck, and I'm sure you're you're well on your way as, on doing that, Mark. So uh, it's amazing to see, and I'd probably have to get get you back on the show when you're well beyond that number to see how 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 it went by. Yeah, no, I'd love to do that. That would actually be a great idea. We're we're like we blow through 200. We should do this again. Okay, no, sounds good. I'm definitely gonna I'm definitely gonna be watching. Um, I just want to quickly really go back to Eloqua because what I found really interesting is Eloqua was a company you grew, you founded it, and you know, there was a lot of passion with the team, but you left before the IPO, and I'm sure it was, it was not an easy time for you. It was difficult. You helped it grow. You helped it scale. So what I really want to know as a founder, as a leader, the CEO, current CEO, how did that experience help you grow to, to the business leader you are today? Yeah, I mean, it was a really, uh, it was a really emotional time, uh, a, a bittersweet time. Um, you know, the bitter part, I think people would understand. It's it's hard to leave a company that you founded. It was hard for me to see. Uh, you know, I didn't have v- very much control over who would take over after me. It was that was painful, but there was there was some sweet aspects of it as well. For one, I'd say, look, leadership is hard. I mean, it is a big responsibility. I had 170 people at the company at the time. I had operations around the world, and I was 32 years old. Um, so, you know, I had a newborn at home. I had a four-month-old, and my wife wasn't working uh, at the time. So, 
it was nice to spend time with my young family. And uh, it was nice to have been relieved of the burden of leadership. Because, you know, a lot of people think about leadership as being all wonderful. And maybe they think you get to boss people around all the time. And, and you get to go to like fancy conferences and drink champagne. No, well, there's a bit of that. Um, mm-hmm. For sure, there's, there's some real benefits to leading. But it's really, really difficult. Uh, to do and you know everyone's you're in a fishbowl every day everyone's watching every move that you make and when you make a mistake as a leader those mistakes have humongous consequences <laughs> for people that you care about you know so so that's tough uh, at the same time I'm lucky to have learned at the age of 32 a lot of really important things about how to lead people and how to build a board of directors and and how to build a real trusting organization at the board level. Uh, and I'm lucky to have gone through that at 32, where I still have a number of at-bats left, I hope. You know, I, I hope Influitive isn't the last company that I build. So it's nice to have done at a young age. And for all the, the young people who are listening, if you're in your 20s, this is a great reason to start a company. Because you, your first company may not be great, but your next company is much more likely to be great. Because... Uh, you know, entrepreneurship can be thought of as a profession, just like anything else. It's like being a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. You get better and better at it every time, every company that you do. So I'm lucky that I went through that at a young age. And I think I'm a stronger leader because of it. My last board at Eloqua was actually quite a dysfunctional one. Really, we did not have a lot of trust. Um, the, you know, we... Anyway, won't go through in big detail, but it was it was a dysfunctional organization, and uh, I'm really proud of the board he put together here, which is uh, a board that is filled with trust. It's a high performance board, and if I didn't go through the experience I went through at Eloqua, then I would not have built the current board that I have here at Intuitive. Um, also, I, you know, culture was something that I did think about at Eloqua, but I didn't obsess about it like I do today at Intuitive, where. Culture really is the most important thing that I build here. And I didn't really fully understand that until I left Eloqua. And I analyzed my mistakes and and what I should do better the next time. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so much more focused on employee growth and development here. I'm much more deliberate about it than I was at Eloqua. And I was only through going through some painful moments at my last company. So, I just want to add, and Mark, I'm sure you could agree with me. The best thing about entrepreneurship as a career is it doesn't end like a sports career or or a golf career or a right like it it could go on till you're a hundred years old if you'd want it to. It, it's so true. It just gets better and better, and it always changes. So it it keeps things interesting. And so I really encourage young entrepreneurs to think of what they're doing as a career. You know that when you do your second, third, and fourth business, that you're going to become truly great at it. And you're right, unlike a, you know, unlike a professional athlete where your body eventually fails you, you know, as an entrepreneur, you just get better, right? You just get, um, particularly on the people side of things, I mean, that's what I've found, and, and also through talking to other experienced entrepreneurs, you know, they'll say, uh, you know, and I have, I, have a, I have a 72-year-old entrepreneur on our board, Dennis Chikazian, he's an amazing guy, and, um, you know, they'll say, like, look, I can't, I, I can't make as many calculations per second as I made in my 20s and 30s, <laughs> right? But I understand a lot more about people and what really motivates them. And at the end of the day, like that is what we do as entrepreneurs. We motivate people to do things, whether the, those are our employees, whether it's motivating our customers and partners to, to buy from us and believe in us, to motivate investors to part with their hard-earned cash to support our businesses, that's what we do, right? We motivate, we inspire, and, and that just gets better with age. So I'm really lucky that I've discovered that this is my way, <laughs> this is my path in life, that I really don't have any other options. Like this is what I'm going to do until I keel over and die. Um, so I might as well be the best entrepreneur that I can be. And I hope other people might be inspired to do the same with their careers. No, that's awesome. Super inspirational. I love it. Thank you again for sharing that. And, and you talk about people and how you're building this culture. And I read recently that there has been some recent changes in Fluidive with your executive team. So i I just really, really interested to know what are the challenges, and maybe there's opportunities as well at this point, when these type of roles all of a sudden open up 
and, and how you fill them. Yeah, so this is the hardest part about being not just an entrepreneur, but, but, an, a, but an executive as well. And, and that is really around people, right? I mean, we make bets on people, right? We, we form hypotheses about people and their ability to grow and develop and, and you know, whether they're going to be able to scale. And even if we're really good at that aspect of our jobs, I mean, maybe we're right two-thirds of the time. You know, the, the, one of the rules that I use for decision-making is uh, I've just – I just called it the Colin Powell rule because that's where I first read it, which is you make a decision when you're 70% sure of something. So if you're going to make a decision on, let's say, who to hire or who to promote or who to let go, if you're 70% certain, that means you're likely going to make a mistake one-third of the time, <laughs> which is pretty high, right? Uh, so I think that's the people, the people decisions are the toughest, Let's say you have somebody who, uh, you have a leader who leaves to another company and you have what you think is a strong second in command. Do you promote them or do you find someone from the outside? Those are make or break decisions sometimes for companies. And I've made that decision right and I made it wrong. And so that's another thing that really gets better as you get more experience, as you get more at bats, is you develop these patterns and you start to recognize them. And I think it improves your odds of success on that front. Specifically with respect to the, the executive team changes that we made. So I went from 12 reports down to seven. And so what I've been feeling over the last, over the last year was that I felt like we were making decisions too slowly. Things are just taking too long to get done. And I think part of it was that our executive team was bloated. There was just too many people. Too many people had to sign off on things. And so... I felt that, and I think my team felt as well, that I'd be better served with a, a much slimmer executive team. Uh, so we went from 12 to 7, and I've taken a much more hands-on operational role for a while in the company. So just getting much more involved with helping people make better decisions, helping people empower other people, helping people develop empathy with each other and develop better connections with each other. You know, I've been getting really involved in that, which has actually not been a traditional activity I've been involved in. And uh, I've really enjoyed that a lot, and I think it's made a big difference. But, that, but that's some of the changes that, that, um, that we made. And, um, you know, probably sometime in the future, we'll expand that team out again, and, and uh, we'll become more venturesome and, and uh, look for new ideas for, for growth. But, but for now, I, I felt we were better served with a, with a slimmer team, and it's working out pretty well. Yeah, and I mean it's it's um, it's advancing through subtraction at this point. It sounds like, and and, and I think to your yeah point, subtraction and 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 through and focus, right? So that's the other thing too is that felt like we needed to do less things but do them better, and so uh, that's really at every level of our business. So in terms of our executive team, yeah, from twelve people down to seven, that means that there are a number of you know projects that would be great to work on, but we're not going to work on. Them. You know, we're much more, I guess, focused in the activities that we work on. We're more focused on the kinds of customers that we're looking to win. And, uh, you know, I think that I think businesses naturally go through these waves of focusing and then expansion, focus and expansion. And, and I think while that could be very unnerving for people in a company, I think it's actually not right. I think that's I think that's actually how good companies behave, because through expansion, that's where you develop new ideas that could be your next big growth vectors. And then you need to focus on the ones that really work. So there's your focus time. And then, you know, you ride those for a while and do really well. Well, now it's time for new ideas again. So you expand that. So I, I think there's this, this natural kind of sine wave that happens in companies. One question I really want to get to before, before I really start closing down, and perhaps it's because I'm from here, but I really want to share your passion and persistence on building, growing global companies like Eloqua and Fluidive in Toronto. Yeah, I mean, Toronto's, a, Toronto's great. I mean, I've, I've had the advantage of living and working in a number of places around the world. Uh, so, I mean, I know how good we have it here, and we really turned a corner. I mean, it's, um, it is remarkable the quality of the founders that are here, the executives, startup executives, as well as scale-up executives, um, the, the smart money that's here now uh, is, 
I think is amazing, and I think we can build really great companies here. You know, I I saw that in you know in the last decade where you know areas like Toronto actually created amazing companies that beat companies in Silicon Valley. You know, especially when when there's not tons of money around, I I think that places like Toronto can do really well. Uh, and I think Toronto's a pretty it, we're at a very special time now, where it's kind of a perfect storm. You know, there's just the the amount of talent that's flooding into the city here is incredible. It's not great for people who want to buy a house. Um, <laughs> and I, unfortunately, I'm I'm on I'm stuck in this crazy housing market right now. It's another story. But um, so I think there's a there's a lot of international talent that is moving here to Toronto from the U.S., from China, India, all kinds of places uh, that I think is really making Toronto a, a truly global city um, and a great place to, to do a startup. Um, the other thing is, you know, building a company in traditional startup centers like, like Silicon Valley, it's, it's hard. Um, you know, it's, it's hard being a small fish in a big pond. And, um, you know, whereas here in Toronto, you can build a great company and have loyal employees that stick with you through thick and thin. There's, there's really a lot to like here. So, yeah, I think it's just it's a great place that uh, you know you're close to almost all the big centers in the U.S. Right, you're an hour from New York and Boston. You're five hours from San Francisco, um, but you're also kind of born global when you start a company here. Um, like I'm off to UK next week, you know, where we've just launched an office, and so you know early to expand into Europe. We're going to be early to expand into Asia. You know, when we expand into Asia, I can hire a gajillion Chinese, Japanese, Korean speakers right here um, in Toronto. You know, so there's uh, there's just there's a lot to like. You know, and I, and I didn't even mention the thing that people normally mention, which is a high quality of engineering talent. Because I don't have to mention that; everyone knows that already. But what people don't know necessarily is that there is a increasing level of go to market talent here and executive talent here that we've not had before. Sales, marketing, business development, customer service, uh, partnerships and alliances, corporate development. A decade ago, you did not find good people, good executives that had those skills. Now there's actually quite a lot, um, and there's more that are coming all the time. So I'm super bullish about this place. You know, we're really seeing the third generation of software entrepreneurs in the in the GTA. Um, there was a wave of folks. I mentioned Bill Tatham, who started Jana, who's part of that sort of first wave that was Jana and Descartes Systems and Open Text and uh, Wattcom. And, you know, so there are a bunch of, of great um, software companies that started back there then when the PC era was, was really cranking. Um, and then the second era where you had people in my generation that were uh, early to adopt the cloud um, and, uh, you know, multi-tenant internet. Um, cloud platforms, and now a third wave, you know, around mobile and uh, machine learning, 3D printing, drones, that sort of thing. And you know, who knows what's coming next? There's a fourth wave that's probably coming in the next five or six years because there's a new platform change every five or six years, and so you have a new crop of entrepreneurs that have grown up with with this environment, whatever the new platform environment is, and they're going to create another wave of companies. So. I really think that we've got what it takes to, um, you know, be the next great startup center, you know, um, on par or better than the Boston area, you know, New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, Austin, Texas. I, I think Toronto is um, as equivalent to all of them, particularly in the software area that I'm pretty familiar with, where I think that we're, we kick ass here. Yeah, no, definitely. And I'm sure you and I could talk about Toronto all day. But I've been I've been having a blast. I wrote a lot of notes. I, I learned a lot from you, Mark, and I hope everyone else listening did. But I guess before we end, I want to just get some final thoughts, maybe some observations from your career, or any actionable actionable recommendations that you can share for for those future leaders, future technology executives who are looking to grow their career at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean the thing that I'm. You know, as I look back over my career, I mean, the thing that's really made a difference for me is the application of the scientific method to really looking at everything, but including including my career. And, you know, people use use that 
in different using different um, different language. So my wife is a physician, and her process for diagnosing a disease she just calls differential diagnosis. It's the same thing. It's you know I have a hypothesis that what you know what this person's really ailing them is X, and I'm going to go through a you know a systematic process of elimination of figuring out what that is. You know there's something popular now in startup circles called lean startup, which is really just the application of the scientific method to building a company. But I think people should look at their careers in the same way, right? They, you might have a hypothesis about what type of company or what type of environment would be best suited for you. And you can then go about testing that. Right? I have a hypothesis that, you know, I'm, I'm going to really like uh, being in a drone sector and, uh, and here's why I think I'm going to be successful. And you list out your assumptions. And then you can go and get a job in that sector and see if those things are true. And chances are, you know, some of those things are true, but there are some things that are not true. So you can go and say, well, given what is true and not true, what would be an even better choice for me? And so, I don't know, I look at life as just a series of discoveries. And, um, you know, it's just, it's really worked well for me. So I guess that's the advice I would I give people is uh, uh, have strong opinions, hold them loosely, uh, continue to... Think of yourself as a scientist or a detective. You're out there trying to discover a, a valuable, valuable secret about the world, valuable secrets about yourself, uh, and then set up your environment so that you can uh, have the maximum chance of success because you understand yourself, um, you understand what motivates you, and you can arrange your environment to bias yourself towards success. Well, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I think ultimately you, you not only gave us actionable items, you, you gave us a philosophy in, in life, which is, which is amazing. And I, I like it and it's true and, and it's perfect. But to close, Mark, just please tell us where we can find more information about you, Influitive, and any, any, any other thing you want to share to us right now. Sure, yeah. So you can find out both more about me and about Influitive on our website. So you go to Influitive.com and... There's actually a section for Mark Oregon there. It's actually my speaker page. It's what I use to, uh, to get speaking gigs. But there's a lot of uh, things about me there. There's videos that I, and, you know, I, as you can tell in this podcast, I, I really enjoy sharing things with other entrepreneurs. I really want to help and give back. And, and that's because so many entrepreneurs were generous with their time and insights with me that I would never have achieved any success without uh, my many mentors that I've had over the years. Um, so I share lots of things. You'll find some great videos that are on, our, on, my, uh, on my speaker page on our website. Uh, you can also find out more about Influtive, uh, Influtive there. So uh, the exact link is Influtive.com slash Mark uh, But you can find it under the About page. And uh, there's lots more about me there. Uh, you can uh, tweet at me at, at Mark Oregon, all one word, and I'll do my, my best to, to answer you. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Love to, um, you know, love to do what I can to help out other entrepreneurs. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll definitely share all the links on the episode page. And again, Mark, I appreciate your time giving back, sharing your experiences and your knowledge on the Business Leadership Podcast. And thank you for joining us. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Edwin. Take care and uh, look forward to our next one when we're blown through 200 people. 100%. Guaranteed. Cool. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if it wasn't obvious, I was really into Mark's leadership style and his thoughts of entrepreneurship. I will definitely have to get him back on the show to see how it was able to hold the culture as they grew past 200 employees. If you're interested in learning more about Mark, I've posted all the links that he mentioned on the episode page located at the business leadership dot com slash zero one zero if you enjoyed the episode please subscribe leave me a comment i would love to hear from you how i can improve and grow the show thank you again until next time edwin signing off thank you for listening to the business leadership podcast at the business leadership dot com